All right, so remember from last time, we talked about the set of all complex value integrable functions on a circle. We defined their inner product as such. And I forgot to prove the triangle inequality, which is an easy consequence of a Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So you have this is equal to this. Well, if you expand it, it gives you this. And because this is less than or equal to 2f times g, right? So that gives you this thing squared. And you take square root on both sides, which gives the triangle inequality, OK? So here comes our um, the title of the lecture. Is this, we're going to discuss the mean square convergence of Fourier um, series. So the goal of this lecture is to prove theorem 1.1. So it states that if f is integrable in a circle, then we have this converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So this form, equivalent thing is that we want to show that this, this goes to zero. Right? Well, or we can just show that this goes to zero. <clears throat> right? So we want to show that this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Right. Now let's start with some discussions. So for each integer n, we let e to the n theta to be defined as e to the i n theta. And, um, for the product, we observe that they are ortho or orthonormal. orthonormal. Right. Well, this is an easy, easy observation. You just write it out and you observe it as either one or zero. And they're also normal, also. So the product of f of bn is equal to x. And it's really just the flow coefficient of function f. And the partial series of Fourier series is really just this, right? En, which is negative by definition. A n is really just okay, and also for for a partial sum, f minus the partial sum, and each e n, right for n less than this, the same product is this, right, and this uh only equal to one when j is equal to n. Is equal to n, so it gives you a n. Like this. Well, this is equal to zero because they're equal to each other, right? Which means that, well, if it is orthogonal, if it's orthogonal to every e n, then it should be orthogonal to every um, series of e n, right? For any b n in the complex number, for any coefficient, right? Because we can use the linearity of n product. Okay, so this is the right here. And continue, we write f as a decomposition as we subtract and we add them up. Then these two are or orthogonal. So we apply the Pythagorean theorem. Right, if they're orthogonal, we have, we have the Pythagorean theorem, which means that the norm squared is equal to this norm squared plus this norm squared. Well, what is this norm squared? Well, it is this and product with itself right so we do some calculations we bring this out right and for here we can bring this out well we have to add a conjugate because we talked about the property of inner products and well they're equal only when i is equal to j right? so we take some with respect to j first and we take some with respect to i first well okay so this thing is equal to this thing. So we can show that that we have the key in uh, key equality. All right. Okay. So, so let's start with a lemma. One point two. One point two. Where is it? Where are you? Um, it's the best approximation lemma. Okay. It says if f is integrable on a circle with Fourier coefficient a n, then we have this inequality. So the norm of f and the partial sum is always less than f with 
any trigonometric uh, polynomial, I think, right? So any C and E n, where E n is e to the i n theta, right? Something like this. For any complex number C n. And equality holds precisely when when C n is just equal to a n, right? Equal to coefficients, yeah. Okay. So the proof is that we write f minus c and e n to be f minus s and f plus b and e n, where b n is a n minus c n. Okay, so here we get a we get a orthogonal property. We just use this trick. Okay, so they're or orthogonal because we have this right. We have this orthogonal, then we apply Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so this norm squared, which is this norm squared plus this norm squared. Well, this is non-negative, right? If this is non-negative, which means that this is always less than this in terms of norm squared, right? Because this is, this is non-negative, right? So here we have a picture to illustrate this idea. So suppose we have e i e zero e to the negative n and they span like the like the space, and for any function f and s and f, well s and f is the linear combination of e from e negative n to e to n, right? Because right, s and f is equal to right the linear combination of them which is a vector on the space. And for f, any arbitrary thing, well, this can be thought about like the projection, like the closest vector is the norm. And like the norm is like, is like the closest one, the, the, the closest one. For any others, right, consider their distance, it should be always greater than or equal to this distance. Okay, so that's like the geometric interpretation of this best approximation and so with that being said we can start proof our theorem 1.1 okay so theorem 1.1 so if f is continuous on a circle if f is continuous then we could apply the corollary of 5.4 which is the Fayette's theorem so continuous function on a circle can be uniformly approximated by trigonometric polynomials well with that being said for any epsilon, we can pick a family of trig polynomials such that we have a capital M such that um, their distance is less than epsilon for all theta and for all n, right? And now we square both sides and we integrate both sides with respect to theta, right? Well, with this, we integrate with respect to zero, two, 0 to 2 pi and divided by 2 pi. Well, still gives this, and this thing, well, it becomes the inner product, the norm square of f minus pn, right? So we have this is true, well, which gives you this by taking square root, right? So, by the Beck's approximation lemma, we have that for all capital M greater than capital M, we have this is true, right? Because you're a trigonometric polynomial. Right, we have this is the approximation lemma, which is less than this. Which means that for any epsilon, we have a capital N such that this is less than epsilon. Which means that this this thing goes goes to zero. Right? Norm squared goes to zero. Okay. So we have done the case that f is continuous, but with f, what if f is only integrable? We can apply lemma 3.2, which we proved in, I mean, a long time ago. Not really long, like last week. So, this lemma says that, I hope you guys remember that, is suppose f is integral on a circle bounded. We have a sequence of continuous functions that it can approximate x. Approximate the function f in some sense. Okay? So, if f is integral, we pick g like we pick g a member of this a continuous function such that well you're bounded by b which is the supreme of f because f is bounded by b okay and we have 
We have this let go equals zero. So we have this required this is less than epsilon squared. Well, then we have this. Well, their norm squared is this, right? Well, which is multiplied two times. And for this, we can use the triangle inequality because they are both bounded by B, a constant. So this is less than some C epsilon squared. So this is less than C epsilon squared. So we take square root, we give f minus g, the norm is less than equal to some constant times epsilon, right? So now we were done stage one. Stage two is that, well, we have g is continuous, right? So g is continuous, then we can apply this again, right? We can approximate g with a family of trig polynomials, and we pick an m cut of, cut of such that, well, your norm is less than epsilon for any n, and by triangle inequality, right? By triangle inequality for any n greater than m. This is less than this, right? Because, right, a family of trig polynomials. And, okay, so I apologize. Um, like, we can just pick one trig polynomial, that's enough. We don't need to pick a family of them. With trig polynomial, okay, so let's check what is going, what is wrong here. So, well, okay, I mean, this part, this part is fine. But here, we'll, well, 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 well. So, the, what is the Beck's approximation lemma says? It says that while well, it's on the integral of a circle, then we have this is true, right? And true not to be at most n, quote, at most n, okay? So even like this is greater than this. If they are not in the same degree, it doesn't really matter, right? Because if it's not as if, if if they're not the same degree, well, if they're not the same degree, then we have f f minus this, right? Which is oh my can we move back to here? Okay. I mean this one is also like kinda wrong. Because um if the capital N here is greater than so if they're not in the same power. Right, so if the power of this is greater than the power, I mean the degree degree of this greater than the degree of this well in the proof right b is equal to n minus cn right so if this n is greater if this has extra terms so this n is greater than this so n1 so this n1 so this n2 if n1 half is greater to be n2 right well how do we manage that right well, we plus b n e n where b n b n is a n minus c n for what for n less than or equal to n two right. Well, what if for for n does between them. Between them, we'll just let bn equal to an, right? We just let bn equal to an, yes. So with that being said, we, um, we still have uh, the equality here, right? And 
these two are still orthogonal, right? They're indeed orthogonal. So we do Pythagorean theorem again. So we still get the result, okay? Okay, because oh, for any complex number cn, well, cn could be some, some last term some, for the last few terms, like for if this is n1, this is n2, right? For the last few terms, it could be equal to zero, so it doesn't really matter, right? So I'm just giving, um, so rigorously, I'm giving um, extra information which is not necessary to talk about it, right? So we just delete them. Right, this is my, this is a beginner mistake before your analysis. Okay. So for lemma, which means that for it, we have, we have this less than the trig polynomial. Like it doesn't matter, so even if n is greater than m, right? such that the degree of degree of p is equal to m. Okay? So I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. So blah 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 continue blah 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 approximately p but polynomials such that polynomials such that the degree of p degree of p is equal to m well which means that we have this right and for any for any n grading with m we still have this best approximation right? i hope you guys agree with me which we apply um the triangle inequality well look f minus g is less than constant and g minus p is also less than so we can group the epsilon which is less than constant times epsilon for any n greater than okay so this proves the theorem so note from above we, we have concluded this equality right if you, if you forgot we have equality here so i just copy paste it down here so for this from this identity with the theorem 1.1 so, so we take limit with respect to n this goes to zero, vanishes, right? And we know that, well, this is a fixed number, then this should be converging, right? Well, which gives the parse of all identity. Hope my pronunciation is correct. Parse of all identity, okay? And we go to theorem 1.3, which, oh, we got theorem 1.3. So 1.3 is really just the summary of what we did. So we can use it in future. So let f be integral function of a circle. We have the mean square convergence of Fourier series, which is we have this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And we have the parse law's identity, which is this is equal to norm of f f norm square, right? Norm of f square, which is this. Right, so here we have some remark. First is that, well, for any ortham, ortham, orthonormal normal family on circle, if we just denote a n to be the a product of f with e n, we still have this, right? So if we can't go back to our very start beginning, if we forgot about this, right? If we just given that they're orthonormal, right? Then f of e n we can denote it as a n. So forgot this part, right? Also forgot this part, right? F e n equal a n, which means that well, notice our reasoning here. None of them are depending on our saying that e j or a j is e j is the function is this given function, and a j is the Fourier coefficients. We're not depending on this fact. We're just giving arbitrary orthonormal sets. All right, so for those, like we still got this, and we also got those, right? I mean, this is not S and F anymore. This is, I mean, we still got those, right? We still have this. We still
stop this. Wait. Well, okay. So from here, we see that we have, we still have this, right? Well, this is non-negative, right? And we have this. And well, this is a increasing series, right? And you're bounded, right? Because this thing in Silex is always non-negative. So for no matter what, this is always bounded by a constant. And you're increasing, so you converges, right? So you converges. And we know that when we take a limit on both sides, you're bounded by this, which means that your limit should also be bounded by the bound, right? But we don't know if this is a premium, but anyways. We get this inequality, which is called the cell's inequality. And the inequality holds when this thing goes to zero, right? when this thing goes to zero, as n tends to infinity, okay? And the second remark is that, well, for any f and r, we have a sequence of Fourier coefficients and parcel identity gives that this Fourier coefficient is in space because it converges. Yeah. So which means that this is in, in the space, right? By definition of the space. Okay, so we keep on going. We have theorem 1.4, which is called the riemann lebesgue lemma or lebesgue riemann lemma. riemann lebesgue lemma. So, it's a lemma, it's named a lemma, but the author states it as a theorem, so, okay, no, I'm right. So, if f is integrable on a circle, then the coefficient goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is really easy proof, because we have Parseval's identity, right? We have Parseval's identity, right? This is really the, well, this is a n, right? We just rewrite it. Well, the necessary condition of a series conver being converged is that the term tends to zero as n tends to infinity, right? Recall from first year calculus. And if the norm goes to zero, then the number itself should go to the, I mean, the zero constant, right? The, the zero as 10 n goes to infinity because when your norm goes to zero, then you yourself must go to zero. Furthermore, if we write out explicitly, we have this goes zero, which means that the real part and imaginary part should both go to zero, right? Or like we can just do some rewriting about this and phase two goes zero as n goes infinity. Okay, so I hope you guys uh, in, like understand. Like, I apologize for like some confusion made in the proof. So, okay. Like, for being perfect, let's just redo everything, redo the proof again. So by best approximation lemma, right, we have this in quality holes. Well, if this, right, the CN, the last few terms could be equal to zero. It doesn't really matter. As long as, okay, if they have the same degree, but the last few CN is, is for any common CN, yeah, so it could be equal to zero, right? right? So if this is N1, this is N2, right? Well, this n two can be filled, can be, can be filled to n by taking all the same to zero 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 zero, which is add up to zero. So you still get n equal to n n one, right? Right, where the c n is equal to, I mean itself. I mean c prime n, c prime n. The c prime n, the new c n is equal to like the c the original c n, where n is less than or equal to n two, where n goes zero, zero when n is greater than n2, but less than or equal to n1, right? So we still get like a c prime n, n1 here. You see what I'm saying? Just take it to zero so we, so that their degree gets the same, which does not affect our proof. Because, well, case one, if you're continuous on a circle, then we can apply this corollary, which means that we can pick a trick polynomial so it converges absolutely, and we take this blah blah blah, which means for any m greater than m, right? The degree, the degree is already fixed, but even your degree is larger, we still have this inequality, right? 
And for f being integrable, we use this lemma for g. And for g, we can repeat our process for this, right? Which gives that, I mean, okay, not, not actually repeating, but for g continuous, right? We have this, right, using this condition. And the long square by direct calculation, we get that, well, f minus g is less than the constant time as well. Well, since g is continuous, right, we can approximate g with a trig polynomial with degree m, right? And by triangle inequality, for any of this, we have this, right? And this, we had used triangle inequality, which is, again, because this thing is less than some c prime epsilon, and this is less than some epsilon, so we can group it some k times epsilon, which concludes the proof. Okay. All right, so that's perfect right now. No, no more confusion. All right. See you guys.